I think we have to take a much harder line in terms of how the WHO has handled this, uh, this virus, because it's clearly been simply a mouthpiece, in my view, uh, for the PRC government. And, you know, it was two days after he visited Xi Jinping uh, in uh, Beijing that Dr. Uh, Tedros uh, decided that finally, a week after he said there was no need um, to declare an international emergency, that he said it was time to declare it an international emergency. So it was almost like he went there and got his marching orders and then uh, came forth and announced them. So, um, you know, the way they criticized Taiwan early on and criticized the U.S. as well when we stopped flights coming in, um, when shortly thereafter China did the same thing. And yet I think that was also one of the things that helped save Taiwan from a much worse situation. So looking after itself, not listening to the WHO in, in this particular case, I think actually helped. What explains Taiwan's success in containing coronavirus, or CCP virus, despite Taiwan's close proximity to mainland China? How has the Chinese Communist Party influenced the WHO? Over past decades, how has U.S. policy towards Taiwan and China been mistaken and short-sighted? And how would the U.S. and other free countries in the West benefit from a closer relationship with Taiwan? In this episode, we sit down with Dr. William Stanton, who served for 34 years as a U.S. diplomat, including two assignments to the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. His final posting was as director of the American Institute in Taiwan, the equivalent role to ambassador. Now, he is the vice president of the National Yang Ming University of Taiwan. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellek. Dr. William Stanton, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. It's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to talk with you. I've often watched you online, and uh, it's quite an honor, actually, to be asked to, to do an interview with you. Well, you know, you're frankly top of my list right now because you are you know, you were in Taiwan, you've been in Taiwan for at least a decade now, um, vice president of uh, one of the major universities, actually a health university, that's, that's incredible, and a ton of diplomatic experience in China. You have this unique perspective where you can, you know, you see, look at the China reality, look at the Taiwan reality, and right now this is front and center with coronavirus. I mean, we have uh, uh, China, which has had, you know, as people are increasingly discussing a very poor and frankly, uh, a lot of the guests on the show are talking about destructive, um, uh, uh, I guess, policy or approach to coronavirus. You know, Taiwan has had a model policy. And then we have the WHO kind of uh, showcased in the middle of all this. And let's hear your thoughts here. Uh, well, Taiwan is, uh, has done a fantastic job. It doesn't surprise me, but a fantastic job in controlling the virus. There have only been I think six deaths uh, as of now, and uh, fewer than 400 cases, I believe, um, somewhere around there. And compared to what we're facing in the United States, of course, it's a much smaller population, but still there are 23 and a half million people in Taiwan, and yet it's really managed to control the spread of the virus. And I think that reflects well on the medical system they have here. But I think it also speaks uh, enormously well for the measures that the Taiwanese adopted from early on, sometimes contrary to what they were being told, the little that they were told by uh, the PRC government officials they met with, but also quite different from what the WHO was saying. So they, they addressed the issues very early on. They were well prepared because of their experience uh, with the SARS outbreak in uh, 2003. It was at that time, I understand, that people got used to wearing masks to begin with when they had a cold, so it wouldn't spread it. But in addition to that, um, you know, they, uh, they were well prepared in other ways. They had already set up a structure for a uh, emergency uh, epidemic committee to make decisions. Um, they, before it was accepted, that this is something you should do. In fact, they were a bit condemned by uh, WHO. 
they began examining all flights, all passengers on all flights from Wuhan. Uh, then subsequently, before it was a general practice, um, they began uh, uh, actually halting all flights from Wuhan. And so, uh, you know, they, they took the right steps. They had a good system. They were prepared. And they also got buy-in from the public. I think the public um, trusts the government for its transparency, its honesty. I mean, it's a democracy. And, um, and the, the public is treated in that way, and they respond positively as well. So everyone is uh, avoiding, you know, maintaining social distance. Uh, I'm teaching classes now through uh, online. So we're all uh, contributing to the ongoing effort. But I think, uh, unfortunately, Taiwan is often overlooked by the rest of the world. And the, uh, the Wuhan virus has caused many people, numerous magazines and newspapers and journals, as well as may many uh, well-known people, personalities, to say, hey, Taiwan's doing a great job. So I'm proud of Taiwan for that reason. And I'm proud that they've been able to show how it should be done to get control of this uh, this deadly disease. No, I mean it's 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 truly remarkable. And I mean, in a way, I, I I've said this a, f a few times to different people. Um, it's almost like the fact that Taiwan isn't allowed, hasn't been allowed into the WHO, kind of helped in this case. I don't I don't know if what 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 your thoughts on that would be. Um, Ironically, I think that's true. Um, I've read online that apparently uh, under the previous administration, under Ma Ying-jeou, who was primarily focused on improving relations with uh, the PRC, or as he would say, mainland China, um, he apparently reached a secret agreement at some point with the Chinese government, the PRC government, that, uh, and this sounds like what probably happened, that Taiwan would be allowed to be an uh, observer, but not a member, when the uh, World Health Organization had its annual meeting. And so for a few years, they were able to go, but there were conditions. They had to go under the name Chinese Taipei. They could not be on a committee that met during that meeting where actually uh, guidelines and uh, the most substantive issues were being discussed. It all had to come from, from uh, the PRC itself. So um, in a way, it strengthened the character and the backbone of the Taiwanese people because they realized that they couldn't, uh, they couldn't count on anyone. So they had to look after their own uh, health system. And they, of course, also developed... Uh, Actually, my, my president, uh, Steve Guo, uh, opened up uh, many years ago the first health office at Tecro in Washington, D.C., so that we could, uh, Taiwan could establish relations with the National Institutes of Health, with the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and improve cooperation on issues like endemic, uh, pandemic disease. So uh, they got a head start. They've always been interested in global health. And uh, the university I'm at now is very much focused on that. And I think in a way, if you exclude somebody, you know, one possibility is they go off in a corner and they feel sorry for themselves. The other possibility is they say, well, I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm going to keep on trying. I'm going to continue to try to get in the WHO. But I'm also going to reach out on my own to other countries, particularly other democracies, who have been more willing to deal with me. And frankly, the WHO has treated Taiwan in uh, under um, the Director General uh, Tedros. I think it's been really abominable, um, uh, particularly his charges that Taiwan is racist. It was interesting, too, because I saw online today that there are an awful lot of Africans in Guangzhou. Uh, and um, apparently, they're all being discriminated against, go home. They fear that they're disease-bearing. And indeed, I remember in the late 80s, when I was in the PRC, 
there was somebody at the foreign ministry who's now Liu Xiaoming. He's now the ambassador in London. He wrote an article in the English language uh, China Daily and basically charged America with being racist. And I saw him at a reception and I sort of got hold of him and said, at this point, he wasn't so high ranking. I said, well, you know, America acknowledged that it's had a problem with race and has tried to address it. But you don't seem to recognize that China has a problem with racism. And I cited in recent months at that time, um, there were two or three incidents on campuses in Beijing and on a bus in one case where a African student would be seen with a, uh, a Chinese student, a female, and they would be harassed and they would be cursed and they would be, in some cases, they were attacked, uh, you know, with fists and so forth. So I think it's interesting that they should use draw the racial card uh, because I've never found in my own years of experience in the six years I spent in China that they were all that enlightened about racial issues. Um, and I find in that regard that Taiwan um, you know, every country has problems perhaps with people of different races or ethnicities, but I think Taiwan's far more accepting of differences among people and tends to treat everybody with courtesy and, and welcoming. So I thought it was particularly ill-suited that uh, Mr. Tedros or Dr. Tedros should decide to pick on Taiwan and call them racist. And then to make it worse, China joined in and uh, had people online send them messages from fake Taiwanese apologizing for being racist. So, you know, it's one thing after another, this, this whole experience with the virus that is generated, and it's quite disturbing, actually. And I, you know, that's why in a recent article I, I wrote, I, I agree with those in the U.S. Congress who are calling for the U.S. to... Um, to cut off its assess fi uh, financing uh, for uh, the WHO as currently constituted. We uh, provide about twice as much about, I think uh, last year it was uh, $52 million, I think, about twice as much, uh, uh, 58 maybe. It was because it was twice as much as China, which I think contributed about 29. And, um, and then we, you know, it's up around 400 million for voluntary contributions that different American agencies and different American uh, philanthropic groups contribute because they're interested in coverage of certain diseases and all. But clearly, um, the I think we have to take a much harder line in terms of how the WHO has handled this uh, this virus because it's clearly been simply a mouthpiece, in my view, uh, for the PRC government. And, you know, it was two days after he visited Xi Jinping uh, in uh, Beijing that Dr. Uh, Tedros uh, decided that finally, a week after he said there was no need um, to declare an international emergency, that he said it was time to declare it an international emergency. So it was almost like he went there and got his marching orders and then uh, came forth and announced them. So, um, you know, the way they criticized Taiwan early on and criticized the U.S. as well when we stopped flights coming in, um, when shortly thereafter China did the same thing. So, uh, you know, they criticized Taiwan for doing that. And yet I think that was also one of the things that helped save Taiwan from a much worse situation. So looking after itself, not listening to the WHO in, in this particular case, I think actually helped. Um, the other thing is I don't think the WHO has done enough to look at um, the, whole, the whole question, why hasn't it elicited from China more information about the viruses, about the genomes, about all the technical details? Why has nobody raised this? And you know, in that regard, I want to give a shout out to the great documentary I saw today about tracking down the Wuhan coronavirus. It's it's long, but every minute of it is interesting. It's about 55 minutes, and it asks a lot of unanswered questions. Given that there was a virology lab 
particularly right in Wuhan, why is nobody, why have they not played a role in trying to uncover the source of this? Why aren't they talked about? Why are they sort of, uh, as, uh, as was said in the documentary, why are they the dog that doesn't bark? And certainly we need to know more about that. And why haven't we heard more about that from the World Health Organization? Um, they should have the ear of the PRC leadership to tell them, is there anything we should know that we can help fight this disease more effectively? You know, so many things coming to mind after what you just said. Um, you know, multiple things. Uh, when it comes to the racism, uh, as you describe, I mean, I keep thinking, you know, forced assimilation policies in Tibet and Xinjiang. I mean, yes. what can be more, ra I, I, I can't even imagine uh, too many things that are more racist in my mind anyway. That's that's one thing that jumped to my mind. And the, the second thing is just the, the insanity of the targeting of African people, like basically uh, uh, people with different skin color for the virus. It just speaks to this power of the CCP propaganda to somehow convince the population that the virus didn't come from China, that it's coming from, is it from Africa? Or, like, this, is, this, is, this is so outrageous to me. Well, they've already pervaded the idea that it came from the United States and uh... I've also seen, I think it was online today, an item suggesting that uh, the sequencing of uh, this virus is so old it may have existed for ages and could go back to Europe, for example. So, you know, because I guess they read the report that some of the virus that has infected people in the United States may have come from Europe, or maybe most of it. I am not quite sure of the details of it. But um, clearly, they're constantly trying to shift blame. So to charge the US with uh, spreading this virus or to charge anyone else is really absurd, especially since it's now uh, the developing countries in Africa, uh, in Asia, and uh, in Latin America that I think are most endangered by the continuing spread of this virus will be the next targets for it. So um, it's unfortunate. It's also unfortunate because the developing countries in general are the countries in the UN, because I spent two years as the director of UN political affairs, which does Security Council issues uh, at the UN from the State Department, uh, gathering consensus within the US government on policies. And it always struck me that it was the developing countries that were most likely to uh, support uh, countries like the PRC. Why? Because the PRC largesse depended in part on that. Uh, there was an awful lot of, uh, uh, particularly in the General Assembly, uh, vote buying and influence peddling. I mean, why was it that after uh, Kim Il-sung died in North Korea, that the General Assembly, which is all the members of the United Nations, uh, you know, they had a moment called for and had a moment or a minute of silence in honor of Kim, Kim Il-sung. I mean, this is extraordinary. And this is the same UN. I know about this personally because I, I wrote a, a, a telegram when I was at AIT complaining that there was a Taiwan student, a college student, who had signed up to join the Model UN program. And the Model UN program gathers students to give them a replica of the UN experience and the only criteria for, for getting into that criterion is that you believe in the principles and, uh, and, and purpose of the United Nations, basically maintaining peace and security, building peace and security around the world. And this student was turned away at the door because he didn't have Chinese identification. He only had Taiwanese identification. So I was so outraged by this, I wrote uh, a cable we wound up getting a demarche at the second highest level at the UN, uh, you know, the US office at the UN. Uh, an ambassador delivered it, not the top guy, but the second one, to the Undersecretary for Political Affairs. And the reaction was, well, there's nothing we can do for this. You know, that's, uh, so um, it's, it's really scandalous. Um, that then they should pick on, you know, pick on Africans. But 
that's the way it is. Um, I got quite used when I was, I mean, one of the great things about being in Taiwan is so often when I was in uh, the PRC, I felt that every meeting was sort of a confrontation. And, you know, it's so nice and pleasant to be in a country where even if you have a disagreement, you're respectful, you're courteous to one another. It's a much better atmosphere. That's absolutely fascinating. You know, the U.S. right now, ostensibly the State Department, is actually acting at this time to try to get um, Taiwan more of a presence in the WHO, from what I understand. And this, I, I think this kind of speaks to maybe the evolution of the U.S., China, and Taiwan policy, you know, over time. And right. I know this is something that, you know, you've been thinking about deeply for quite some time. Right. Well, you know, one of the things if the U.S. is really serious about getting Taiwan into the WHO, they need to abide by the Taiwan Relations Act, which in 1972 said, I'm paraphrasing here, nothing in this act should in any way lead to uh, the withdrawal of Taiwan from any international financial or other international or institution or any international organization. Well, what happened in 1998, uh, President Bill Clinton was on his long visit to China. And on one of his stops, he announced some sort of gifts to China, one of which was he announced for the first time that it's the policy of the United States. It might have been an implicit policy at times, or maybe the way the United States behaved. But he said that um, no country which, whose statehood is not recognized should be allowed to enter into any international organization where statehood is a requirement. So if the State Department and the U.S. government really wants to get um, Taiwan into international organizations, and some of the others include Interpol, ICAO, which deals with civil aviation. These are important matters of safety and security. Um, what the U.S. needs to do is say, well, you know, this policy statement was inconsistent with U.S. law, and therefore we're going to address it. And we think that uh, it should not be barred from membership and make a stand on that basis. But I don't know, you know, there are too many people who say, well, it just, it would be impossible to just ruin the international organizations. Um, it would just cause everything to come to a standstill. We can't do that. Uh, but on your larger point, actually, there has been an enormous evolution in relations. Um, I would say going back um, probably to 2011, um, but certainly 2014, 15. Um, if you look at the Pew surveys that are done on public opinion, the survey that was done last year on whether you view China favorably or unfavorably, 60% of the American public uh, viewed it unfavorably. And in previous years, it only began to turn toward the unfavorable trend around 2011, 2012. And there are other um, things that you can point to in terms of uh, journalistic opinion, opinions of the media. For example, in 2015, uh, there was a, uh, a study done, it was a seminar of former China hands who had been reporters in China. And the title of the seminar, and it was later published as a book that can be found online, has the American media, even though it should be, I think, have the American media, misled um, the American public, or have the media misled the American public about China. And it was quite clear the conclusion of that was, yes, we did. We took this very starry-eyed view of how China would evolve. And of course, beginning in 2012, when Xi Jinping became general secretary of the Communist Party, everything began to change because he's a true believing Marxist. And he immediately and increasingly has taken power. So 
on the one hand, I think you had an American public and American elites and political leaders who were increasingly skeptical of China. Um, and you also uh, had a China which was increasingly unpopular because of its oppressive policies uh, toward religious groups, toward ethnic minorities in China, and its more aggressive policies uh, in its own neighborhood and elsewhere in the world, uh, basically bullying other countries. I wrote a, a commentary not too long ago reminding everybody that China itself stated its position uh, in the uh, Shanghai communique, the first communique with the United States, uh, big countries should not bully small countries. Um, but that's what it in fact does. So um, there has been a shift. And I think a lot of the, the reason for the original optimism for China was totally misguided. Um, a lot of it goes back, and many people have said this to Henry Kissinger. Uh, he, on behalf of President Nixon, he didn't know much about China, but he was sent there to establish relations. And his whole uh, argument, and the argument also of President Nixon in the time, was, well, our, our real problem is still the Soviet threat. So what we need to do is to somehow separate, split off China from the Soviet Union. It was a geostrategic move. And of course, uh, everybody's always admired, uh, including Kissinger himself, his geostrategic thinking. And so there was this whole plan that, um, you know, China would become increasingly an ally, a friend of the United States. I mean, that's what we did with Japan, after all, and with Germany at the end of World War II. So there were certain pre precedents that you could point to. Of course, that whole idea collapsed in 1989 with the uh, collapse of the Berlin Wall, and then in 91 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and along the way, having seen what happened with the Berlin Wall, uh, you also had Tiananmen intervening, which also caused China, including Deng Xiaoping, to make a, take a much tougher stand. So that was a mistake. A second mistake was there was the belief that if we, we had um, better relations with China, um, we would be able to solve um, strategic, international, um, uh, bilateral, regional issues. We would be able to move forward on all of them. There's a story I heard after uh, the 2015 visit of uh, Barack Obama as president to China. He spent about four days and three nights there. He had been told by his staff, some of the people who still foster the idea of cooperation with China, um, that we absolutely need Chinese cooperation if we're going to make progress on international, regional, bilateral issues. So he went um, feeling that there was real progress possible. And instead, what happened, uh, according to this, nothing happened. The Chinese were feeling very... Um, very good by about their economy. Um, and they got no concrete results out of the visit. Of course, there was a bunch of verbiage and different signed uh, language that they agreed on, but it was all generic stuff. So on the way back, according to the person I talked to who heard it secondhand, but I think it, it sounds about right. Barack Obama supposedly said, well, let me get this straight. We need, we need uh, Chinese cooperation to solve bilateral, regional, international problems. I guess after this visit, we can pretty, well, pretty much say, we're not going to make progress on any of these issues, are we? <laughs> so I think that was a, a delusion, a self-delusion that we had. The third thing that happened was there was also a, a view that if we had better relations with China, a stronger, more self-confident China, it would be an international stakeholder. Um, I remember writing uh, talking points that also it would open up China. If China was wealthier, it would move in the direction of democracy. This was the way that we could overcome the human rights advocates in Washington who said that, no, we can't give China most favored trading status. 
It's unacceptable. We already gave them World Trade Organization participation. That hasn't worked out all that well. But you know, there was strong pressure from big companies, you know, the investment bankers, um, the computer companies, you know, the same kinds of people who have shipped um, all of our vital uh, supplies for medicines, for protective gear, for hospitals, uh, for test kits, all that's being made in China. These same people, because they could make it more cheaply and make more money, they were totally for uh, giving them this most favored trading status, and they won. And that never turned out to be true. In fact, with Xi Jinping coming to power, it became less liberal, less open. And then everybody also thought, um, well, you know, if nothing else, um, we'll make money there. And it's true, some people did make money there. Um, but also millions of people, I've heard different estimates, some three million, some more, American workers would lose their jobs in the process. And while economists were always talking about in the long term, for a worker, if you're 45 or 50 years old and you've been working in a certain plant all your life making car parts, and now you're told you're not needed, you've lived your whole life there, your family there, your community's there, maybe your church is there. You're supposed to pull up and move on and retrain and become a computer expert. I find it hard to use computers now. <laughs> I've, I've sort of grown up with computers a little bit. Um, so that never worked out either. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of those same people are still giving advice, even in my view, in the current administration. Uh, so, you know, there are good people, but there are other people I'm less, more skeptical of. I, I, I enjoy very much listening to Peter Navarro. Uh, I enjoy uh, hearing from, uh, you know, or hearing about the decisions Matt Pottinger makes. I'm very impressed by Pompeo. Um, but some of these other people, it's it's more of the same. So, you know, uh, we'll have to see how U.S. policy evolves in the future. Um, finally, um, the other thing we did was we totally underestimated Taiwan. Back in 1972, Chiang Kai-shek was in charge. Everybody said, well, Taiwan's a basket case. It's only a matter of time before it drops into China's lap anyway. So you know, let's not think about that. Nobody, nobody really foresaw, and particularly people who had never been to Taiwan, like Kissinger, his whole life he's never been there. Nixon maybe should have had more of a glimmer because he least visited when he was vice president, but nobody predicted or could foresee that within four decades, uh, Taiwan would become a democratic, prosperous, uh, thriving nations with advanced science, with advanced technology, a leader in, in things like microchips, uh, 1.4th or 5th until China started applying for U.S. patents, a 4th or 5th in patents uh, every year in the United States. Uh, now it's six, I think, in the most recent year. But uh, with a tremendous health system, rated one of the highest in the world. And for people who come to Taiwan, they also see it's an incredibly safe welcoming place to come. You know, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful country. And to think that some people want to take that away, you know, it makes me really quite distraught. And particularly because when I look at, I once wrote a commentary on this, when you look at the Chinese elites, what do they do? You know, thousands of them have emigrated to other parts of the world, usually Western democracies. That's where they send their children. There are some 400,000 Chinese in American colleges and secondary schools, and it's even more than that. Uh, they move their money out to, to safeguard it to these play, to Western democracies. They buy real estate there, and if they can, they immigrate. And there are studies going back several years from uh, Hurun in Shanghai, which does studies of Chinese wealthiest people about the decisions they make. Right now, I think still, um, she went to Harvard before, Xi Jinping's daughter. She, last year, went back again. So, you know, they're always leaping, leaving their options open because they're the people who have the most to lose. So I think a lot of the blame, though, I think, is the United States. I think our policies were naive. They were short-sighted. Um, 
they were mistaken in many cases. You know, so actually, what do you make of the fact that I think the I think I have this right, that the first uh, congratulatory call from an international leader that the President Trump got was from President Tsai Ing-wen of Taiwan, and that, that he took that call. I mean, it was, a, it was a very public thing. It was very unusual, right, uh, uh, given our discussion of policy here. But w what are your thoughts on that? Well, I was elated um, and was hoping for the best, but... Um, Having spent 34 years in the State Department, I, uh, in, you know, working for the State Department, I was, I was not overly optimistic because I noticed uh, after a strong PRC reaction that he walked it back a little bit. Um, and periodically he said things that are positive about Taiwan, but he also says things the president does that are very positive about Xi Jinping. Um, and, you know, the other day I was, I was disturbed that he said uh, uh, great respect in a tweet he sent, because I don't think that's a, that was, would not be the language I would pick for somebody, um, you know, who has not exactly been a sterling example of upholding human rights. So I, I think it's hard to say I hope for the best and, uh, you know, um, I I think that what I do hope now is that this experience of the coronavirus and the enhanced reputation that Taiwan has as a result of its handling of it, uh, you know, universal acclaim, not only from magazines and journals and newspapers, but also from individual countries, you know, for the fact that it's donated um, mass and protect uh, to the United States. It hasn't sold them and then later on claimed that they were donated to other countries as the PRC has done. And they also haven't donated things that turn out to be defective, as I think has been the case in Spain and Italy and, and Czechia. And, um, you know, I think in England, we saw Conor McGregor, uh, the boxing guy, <laughs> was complaining about they sent bad, bad face masks. I, I think I'm hoping that this new recognition, this new awareness of Taiwan will help build support in the United States and in other Western democracies to give China more, uh, to give not, to give Taiwan a second, a second look, a closer look to see how maybe we should be working more closely uh, with Taiwan. And maybe we should not always be looking over our shoulder at the PRC. That's my hope. You know, I mean, you kind of can't imagine a more positive PR situation for Taiwan. I mean, I, 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 I'm thinking about it. It's, 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 you know, just simply by its, uh, you know, functioning as it does, as it has grown to be transparent, as you say, you know, democratic and just open, I think. Um, and this is just kind of all of these features are showcased uh, uh, through in exactly this coronavirus situation. Everyone's wondering, what's Ta what has Taiwan done? Hey, <laughs> right, there's something here, right? It's almost like a screenplay that has a happy ending. <laughs> you know, suddenly everybody says, oh, Taiwan, Eureka. <laughs> but I, you know, Maybe that's not the way the world operates. <laughs> but there, there is hope that some countries at least will be more, take a closer look at improving their relationships with Taiwan. And I, I hope, I've often said Taiwan also needs to reach out not to, only to its 15 remaining diplomatic allies, but should also continue to try to foster relations with other important countries in the region and in the world. And I think uh, from what I've seen under Tsai Ing-wen, there has been that effort. Uh, the go south, uh, the new go south policy, certainly in terms of the relationship with the United States, uh, the relationship with Japan, uh, potentially the relationship with India. There are people in India talking about that. I uh, just read an article by a couple of, two articles actually by two scholars in India that, you know, there's a lot of balancing going on and counterbalancing. And uh, 
you know, I think as more and more people have become aware of uh, potential Chinese threats, I think there are many countries like Vietnam, for example, who are thinking long and hard and uh, are inclined to uh, to get it on board with other countries who, you know, the Quad, you know, which includes Japan, the United States, Australia, and India. But, you know, they, they might not do that because it might be too risky for them, but that they'll continue to cooperate in other ways with the United States and other countries. You know, that's actually a very interesting segue into this whole discussion, I guess, of Taiwan. I mean, the last time uh, we, we talked before, you know, talking about this coronavirus situation, we were talking about, um, you know, the elections and the Chinese Communist Party influence, attempts to influence those elections. Of course, that failed miserably, um, thankfully. Um, but how are Taiwan-China relations and then, you know, this, this kind of whole region, the regional relations evolving at the time of coronavirus? Um, you started talking about this here, but can you give me a little more? Well, I think um, if the United States decided to do something more forward-leaning with regard to Taiwan, like, for example, say, that the U.S. doesn't agree anymore that uh, recognized statehood recognized by other countries should be a precondition for participation in international organizations. And China would object to our change of position, but we could argue that, well, our position in the three communiques was very clearly stated that there were, we're, we had two conditions. One is there had to be a peaceful settlement. Any, any resolution of differences had to be peaceful. As soon as China issued the 2005 anti-secession law, which listed all kinds of things that Taiwan could do, change its flag, call itself a new name, uh, declare independence, have a vote, a referendum on independence, any of those th things, they would be uh, that they would be abrogating the anti-secession law that they passed for themselves. They would be in violation of it and trying to reserve the right to use force to settle the issue. We could then say, well, as soon as they said that back in 2005, we should have said, well, don't forget our signature on the three communiques, certainly the first and the third, because the second was about it was General Haig's resolution about not selling more arms. Um, the first and the third were always conditioned on one, you have to respect the rights, the human rights of the Taiwanese people, and two, or the people of Taiwan, they probably said, and number two, or number one, any settlement of your differences has to be a peaceful settlement. So in a sense, in 2005, they, they violated our understanding as we set it forth in the joint communique back in 1972. So um, I, I think we have more, you know, arrows in our quiver. We have more, we have more things than we can do, but it's a question of whether we're willing to do them. I think arguments can be made for doing more. And I would like to see us do more for Taiwan. Well, you know, I've been seeing reports of you know, these uh, uh, Chinese overflights, you know, coming close to the uh, Taiwanese mainland. I mean, there's this report of, uh, of a Chinese naval vessel sinking uh, uh, a Vietnamese fishing boat. I mean, it's almost like in the heart of, in the midst of this, uh, uh, and Gordon and Chang spoke about this in when we talked recently, there's this China starting to agitate. The Chinese Communist Party is doing something uh, there in the region. How do you read that? Well, there was also, I think, um, uh, attack on a Philippine fishing boat as well, if I'm not mistaken. There was more than one incident like that. I think um, I think it's partly related to the uh, Wuhan flu or the Wuhan virus. I think it's partly to show just because we're distracted by this virus, we're getting back to work now, and we've never lost sight of our long-term regional goals, and we're going to show our military muscle. I, I think it's also uh, 
a signal to the United States at a time when everybody clearly is rather enthralled by what Taiwan has managed to do, and I think they are better, rather peeved by that, to say, don't forget, we still have the weapons, the might, we can, you know, we can call the shots. So I've been happy to see, though, in turn, that the U.S. has also been continuing to fly the flag through the Taiwan Strait and, uh, you know, has indicated in other ways that it remains very supportive of Taiwan. But uh, we'll have to see. I hope, you know, everyone's great fear is that Taiwan one day will decide to go to war. And, um, you know, I, I don't think so. But if, if, if they do, I sure hope the United States would intervene. If we don't, you know, basically, we've abrogated all of our treaty alliances yeah, because Japan will look at we're do what we're doing. Australia will look at what we're doing. Um, you know, there's already enough problems with our allies uh, in Asia and in Europe. And they'll say, well, we can't look to America anymore for support. So I hope um, that we would do what is necessary in the event that there is a threat to Taiwan. Uh, meanwhile, Taiwan has also been bolstering its own armed forces, which is it's long needed to do. And under President Tsai, it's been doing that. And um, I also think that J Japan has a lot to lose in this situation as well. Um, so the Japan recognized the clear need um, that Taiwan and U.S. support for Taiwan may be the only thing standing between it and, and the Chinese military. So they've been getting stronger as well. So, you know, these are only personal views of mine, but <laughs> um, I, I do hope we will show support for Taiwan. Well, so for the typical American or typical, typical Canadian or frankly, you know, anyone else uh, in a free country that is watching Taiwan right now, um, what, is the, what, what would you say is the big benefit for their country to, and to, to basically establish these closer ties to Taiwan and for, and, you know, for their own person? Yeah, I think the, the answer is, um, well, the idealistic answer is that we are all democratic countries. We respect rule of law, human rights, and that to the extent we walk away from any of us who might face a threat, it diminishes the strength we as a community of nations have in, in fostering the values we hold dear. I mean, fundamentally, our problem with the PRC was not only that we never had common interests, that, for example, you know, they would sign an agreement not to proliferate, but they would continue to provide um, the materials for nuclear me weapons and missiles to the North Koreans, um, to the Iranians, to the Pakistanis, um, but we don't have the same values. Um, it's the values we hold dear that the Chinese don't agree with either. And the Chinese have always recognized that in, in, in the PRC. They've said, yes, well, we have different histories, we have different heritage, we have, uh, you know, much different experience of the world, we have different societies, cultures. So um, it's inevitable that we have different values. And, but you have to respect ours as we respect yours, maybe they say, but I don't think so. Um, but we have neither values nor interests in common. There are some people who have interests in common. The people have made a lot of money there, um, but that's all. So I would make that argument. Second of all, I would make the strategic argument, which is simply that, you know, if the US walks away from Taiwan, why won't it walk away from you? Um, you know, again, we all have a common interest in solidarity among our nations. So um, it's not, you know, it's many, it's not something new. Many people have said Taiwan's the canary in the coal mine for PRC um, hostilities toward other, other nations. You know, maybe they think if they take Taiwan, then they can just call the shots in the rest of Asia. 
but um, they certainly want to push the United States out of Asia, certainly out of the uh, the the two uh, defensive uh, rings that uh, U.S. bases provide. So, um, you know, when we, you know, if we go, there's, it's hard to go back. Um, we've already seen the Philippines, the military, I think, is very pro-U.S. President Duterte has got a pet personal peeve, I think, with the United States. He said, get out, because we wouldn't give a uh, a guy who is shooting people on site for drugs, uh, we wouldn't give him a visa. Uh, we've had also, um, you know, I think some of the Southeast Asian countries, except for uh, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, um, and to a greater extent, certainly Laos, Cambodia are very much sort of in the Chinese pocket now. Uh, it's not very diplomatic to put it that way, but that's effectively what's happened. Um, Philippines wavers back and forth, uh, gives different signals at different times. I think Indonesia and Malaysia in more recent months over the past uh, year and maybe last year to a certain extent uh, have made stronger statements about um, PRC incursions into their territorial waters. So we're all in this together. We all have common interests. And I think to a greater extent than with the PRC, much greater extent, we have shared values uh, as well as shared interests. Um, Bill, that's a fascinating look into the kind of geopolitical reality uh, in that region. You know, speaking about the shared values uh, at the Epoch Times, and certainly I myself personally, I really like to distinguish starkly between the value system of the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese people as much as the Chinese Communist Party has been trying extremely hard to force that value system on, on the populace. Um, so, so I don't know, I don't know about, I, 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 I'm not sure, maybe there are some shared values. Well, with the Chinese people, absolutely. Um, you know, the Chinese values that I admire so much here in Taiwan, um, the Taiwanese people are, um, you know, they believe strongly in education. They cherish families. Um, they cherish um, community. They, uh, they still, many of them practice traditional religions. Uh, they, they certainly write in traditional Chinese characters. Um, they still practice uh, traditional Chinese calligraphy, just as many people do in mainland China. You may have noticed in the course of my talk several times I would say China and I would correct myself and say PRC. And the reason is I don't want anyone to think that I have anything at all against Chinese culture or the Chinese people. I don't think of modern day People's Republic of China as equivalent to just China. I think it's altogether different. After all, um, Xi Jinping who made it very clear when he he stepped up to be uh, the general secretary in 2012. He made it very clear that he believed in Marx and Engels and quoted them in his speech to, to the Politburo. Um, this is a Western, a Western philosophical goal and ideal that died even in Russia, <laughs> where it originated. And yet, so it's a very alien concept. You know, I remember Secretary of State George Shultz, who I got to know when I was the Lebanon desk officer. And he used to say, I also, when I was the year I was at the Hoover Institution, he was there. And um, he said to me that, you know, I've always said that what Deng Xiaoping did when he opened up was not so much anything he did was he just allowed the Chinese people to be Chinese, to do what they best at, to go out and grow more food, to open businesses, to make money, to be productive, to look after their families, you know, and get rid of all of this alien stuff about the great leap forward or the cultural revolution or these ideological concepts, which have never really been all that much a part of a more pragmatic framework for many Taiwanese. At the same time, Taiwanese also can be very religious. 
there are, are many Taiwanese who who practice a range of religions, and Taiwan is very um, is very open. It's not it doesn't it's not prejudiced about that. They never I oh what religion are you? You know what you hear in the United States. Um, oh, you're a Protestant. What what branch of Protestant faith? That kind of thing. So I I apologize if anyone got the idea that I was talking about China. I'm really talking about the currently constituted government of the People's Republic of China, the Chinese Communist Party. That's why I never said, uh, unless I made a mistake, China virus. I said Wuhan virus, or I said the uh, the Wuhan flu once. I think um, I don't want people to think that I'm I'm directing my comments against Chinese. I lived I've lived for now. It'll be going on 18 years of my life in a Chinese society. Um, Taiwan is is other things. It's not only Chinese. Uh, it's more multicultural than that, uh, more so than in China, because if you're a different cultural or ethnic background, you seem to get stepped on. But um, you know, I I do respect uh, the Chinese uh, as a civilization, as a culture, and as a people. Bill, this has been a really fascinating conversation. I mean, I, I think I've used the word fascinating perhaps too many times. It's kind of a, a, a trope on the show now. Um, uh, any final words before we finish up? No, I, I just welcome the opportunity to frankly express my personal thoughts about these issues. I know there are a great many people who may disagree with them. That's fine. Um, you know, I welcome... Um, I welcome disagreements. Um, everything I said is not said in any spirit of, uh, of animosity toward anyone, but uh, it's said mostly out of a feeling of, of uh, great respect and admiration for Taiwan and great disappointment in uh, the current government uh, that, runs, uh, that runs China. Bill Stanton, such a pleasure to have you. Pleasure is mine.